to the Gentleman Badass Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Today we've got, uh, seems like all of our episodes are special episodes these yeah. days. Uh, that's kind of where I wanted to, to, to get us with uh, the Gentleman Badass. But uh, today we've got Stapes Stapleton uh, on Skype. Uh, where are you right now? Where are you located in the world? Right now I'm, I'm sat just outside Manchester Airport. Uh, my wife's just getting back from Spain, gotcha. so I'm, I'm uh, just waiting for a uh, plane to land. Yeah. Okay, so we're on Skype with Manchester. Um, and so um, Stapes is a, a really interesting guy. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more. Mick has had the opportunity to work, work with him in a uh, coaching role. And um, so, yeah, uh, former Special Forces, Royal Marine, lots of other cool stuff. So, um, you know, with all of our guests, we kind of like to start with a background to get an idea of where you came from. So tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up and then uh, maybe how you uh, decided you wanted to, be, to join the military. Yeah, I mean, um, my, my, my childhood and, and growing up, um, I, you know, you hear a lot of people who've kind of followed my path that have come through bad childhoods or whatever, but that's not the case for me. Uh, I had a brilliant upbringing by two absolutely brilliant parents who are, who are literally are my idols, you know. Uh, I tried to take the lessons that my mother and my father taught me growing up and use them in my life now. Uh, I grew up in Rochdale, which is just a town north of Manchester. Um, finished school, no, nothing special really. I was no, never anything special at school. I wasn't really interested in school. Uh, I kind of, from an early age, I had the mindset that uh, if, I'm, if I'm really interested in something, I'll give it 110%. If I'm not interested in it, I'll give it 0%. Mm. And school got the zero. Um, <laughs> You know, I kind of always found felt that I was going to do something other than the average kind of academic route that people, you know, be finishing doing a degree or being a worker in an office or whatever. I never felt any affinity to that. I was always, I didn't know what it was I was going to do, but I always knew I was going to do something different, something on my own two feet. Uh, and that's that's basically what led me to joining the Royal Marines. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned lessons that your parents taught you. What uh, what would you say some of the most important that they taught you were? Well, my, my mother and father are, are chalk and cheese. They're, they're absolutely totally different people. Um, like they've since they, they've split up during, during when, I, when I was um, a teenager. Uh, and one of the things that I, I always respected, and I still do respect about both of them, and, I, and I've mentioned this uh, lately to some people that are going through hard times themselves, is that. When, when they did split up, they both always made it um, that it was, to me and my brother, totally amicable. They never like tried to make us pick sides or they never tried to push us one way or the other. They just both got on with it. Um, both were full-time workers. You know, they both had full-time jobs, so they were both holding down the full-time jobs at the same time as obviously trying to rebuild their lives. And it, it's something I always respected. Uh, it, my my mum is like probably the most determined person I've ever met. Um, if if she's if she's on with something, she's on with it a hundred percent. And mm. I think that's where I got my all or nothing mm. mentality from, you know. Um, and so that like the main lesson I've always took my, from my mum would, would be that determination. I would say, is, um, you know, if you're going after someone, go after it a hundred percent, or or you know, don't even talk about it. Okay. Um, my dad's very similar in that way as well. My dad, my dad was in the military. Uh, he was in the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, uh, and he and he stayed in the uh, I don't know what you call it. You call it the reserves over there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The reserves, yeah. Like our our version of the reserves. My dad was in the, the military reserves uh, for about twenty years after he left the regular military, and he had a really good, strong set of friends. Uh, he's got maybe five or six friends that I call my uncles, and. Uh, I'd say probably the, the biggest lesson I've learned from my dad is that is, is that friendship and loyalty to your friends and um, being personable, you know, be, being someone that you that people will like to get along with, and easy going, and um, always being there for your friends and family. Yeah. Was your dad an officer? No, he worked for a living. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was. Uh, he, he finished up as a warrant officer or a colour sergeant. I think he yeah, actually colour sergeant. Um, he obviously he joined the Fusiliers as a, as a recruit, passed out basic training, and then he did a couple of tours of duty in Northern Ireland back when the troubles were at the you know at the height. Uh, I'm sure 
you, you'll know a lot about that yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah, he did a couple of tours in there. I think maybe London Derry and uh, Belfast, I think. Um, yeah, as a, as a private soldier back then. And then when he left and joined the reserves, I think that, that's when he uh, rose to the rank of both sides. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. So then uh, you joined the Royal Marines. Tell us a little bit about how that process went and then how you kind of started going deeper in that process. Well, I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, I, I never, through school or whatever, I never was, like, I, I wasn't one of these guys who grew up knowing I'm going to join the Royal Marines or anything. I, you, when you speak to some guys in the Marines, because it's like, to join the Royal Marines is a, is a pretty big deal, you know, it's a, it's a big commitment, it's, it's a very difficult task to get through that 32 weeks of basic training. So you get a lot of people who are like, they knew they were going to do that from the, from the age of 10, whatever. That wasn't me. I, I kind of always knew that I was going to do something different. I didn't know what that thing was until one of my friends who, who actually joined the Royal Marines later as well, um, Matthew Williams, uh, one of my best friends. And me and him were talking about the army and stuff like that. And then he, he was like, back in the days when YouTube wasn't around or anything like that. And Matt was like, you're going to join the army? Nah. Check these guys out. And he showed me like some videos that he found in the Marines and some posters and uh, a bit of stuff that he got from the recruitment office about how like, how badass <laughs> yeah. the Royal uh, Marines were. And it was at that point I was like, that's what I'm going to do. That That's what I'm going to do, man. You know, uh, and that's kind of what got me started. And yeah, my, you know, he, he motivated me for it, yeah. And you were 17 when you joined. Is that a, a standard age? Or is that a little young? It's on the young side. Um, people, you can join the Royal Marines from, I believe, I think it's 17. You get people joining all the way up to the age of 32. Um, I'd say the, the average age would probably be around 21, 22. And, and personally, I'd probably say that that would be the better age rather than mm. 17. Cause you've learned a little bit about life and you're giving yourself a better head start in, uh, in the Royal Marines. If, if you... If you go in there with that little bit of life experience behind you, you know, when I joined the Marines at 17, it was a culture shock, to say the least. Mm. And uh, there, there was a funny thing that happened where normally th there's actually a train station at the, the Royal Marines uh, Commando Training Centre, and normally you get a train and you get dropped off at the train station, you get off the train and you're straight into the Commando Training Centre. Well, that didn't happen with us. There was something wrong with the train line, so they, uh, they got us a train to Exeter, and then we were picked up on a huge coach from Exeter to take us to Commando Training Centre. And I remember there was a, a drill sergeant on the train waiting to pick us up. No, sorry, on the waiting to pick us up on the coach from the train station. And uh, he he was like, when we first got there, we're in the train station. We're still civilians at that point. We haven't crossed the boundary of joining the Royal Marines yet. We've not got into camp yet. So he's like. <laughs> Get it nice and friendly. He's like, come on, guys, get your kit on the bill on, on the bus. You know, we'll, we'll set off in five minutes, chaps, and dead friendly. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, this is cool. You know, <laughs> these, guys, these guys are all right. They're not what everyone makes out. And all the way on the coach journey, he's like making small talk. Where are you from, lads? Where are you from? Uh, what made you join up? How old are you? You know, all that sort of stuff. We pull up at the main gates. There's like guys on guard there, obviously, and then all our nerves start kicking in, and you're like, oh man, this is real now. We drive through the gates, he sits down and he's, he's bam the stops. There's no more Mr. Friendly, Mr. Nice Guy. We drive down into what's called the, the foundation block, which is like, it's a huge one, like you see on Full Metal Jacket, it's a room just like that. So there's like all 68 of us in there. So, the second we pull up, he's like, get out the... Can I swear on this one? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. He's like, get off the fucking coach. Get the fuck... Get your kick out. He's screaming and shouting. and Our world's just turned upside down. A culture shock is the only way I can express it. You know, <laughs> Our world was turned upside down within seconds by this guy. One minute it was a nice uncle kind of character. The next minute he's screaming and shouting. I was kicking us down the steps of the coach, telling us to pick all our suitcases up and sprint over to the accommodation block. Oh, man, it was terrifying, yeah. So how many weeks of basic 36, is that what you said? 32. 
Shit. I think yeah. that's starting to be standard over here, too. Is it's, it really? Wow. Well, yeah, it might not be that in, long. In, in, the, in the rest of the military, like in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force or whatever, I think it's about eight. Eight to twelve weeks. Yeah, space. yeah, that's yeah. You're right. And yeah. then they'll go off from there and they'll specialize as like an engineer or yeah. whatever like that. But in the Royal Marines, the big thing for us is you are a Marine first before anything else. You're a soldier first. Afterwards, you can specialize. I, I specialize as a heavy weapons specialist and uh, as a PTI, physical training instructor later. But you are a Royal Marines commando first. So before you get to pass out the training. You have to pass all the commando tests. You have to pass all your commando training. Um, so it's 32 weeks long. Um, and it's, as far as I know, uh, and this is what they always tell you, it might have changed now, but as far as I know, it still is the only military camp in the whole of the world where the officers and the recruits all do the same basic training, the, the same exact 32 weeks of training, and then the officers then follow on with their officer and administration mm. skills, which takes them up to about, I think, 60 weeks of basic training, which wow. is pretty damn horrific. Yeah. Now, were you uh, were you in martial arts at this time, or when did all that start? Well, I mean, can I, off and on, I, I, I boxed, you know, through my, through my teen years, but I wasn't serious about it. I was, I was serious about it. Instead, you know, I'd like have six months where I'd never miss a, a class, and then I'd have six months where I'd, I'd turn once a week or whatever. And I'd done some Thai boxing as well, but I wouldn't ever say that I came from like a, a, a martial arts background. It, it was kind of a maybe a hobby more than anything. Who did you, uh, I have a good mate uh, in Manchester that thai, teaches Thai boxing, Tony Moore. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. 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 Who did you Thai box yeah. with? So I, I did Thai boxing at uh, just like a local kind of uh, youth project. It, it, it was just a, a small room that could probably fit 10 guys in with a wooden floor. So if you got swept, you, you were going to go home with a broken elbow. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing special. Um, yeah, it just was what it was. It, it, was just, uh, it was just a couple of guys who were interested in Thai boxing. They'd done Thai boxing and they were trying to do something good for the local community. It was really cool, yeah. So the little bit that you had done before you went into basic, did that did that help you? Did that serve you well by the time you hit basic training? No, I, I wouldn't say so. I, I mean, in I would like to think that it helped me in my fitness wise, but in reality, it's just a total different type of fitness. You know, you can there's absolutely nothing that can compare to doing your commando tests. Mm. And, uh, since I, since I joined, well, since a year before I joined the Marines, I, my whole life has been dedicated to fitness. You know, I've, I've trained twice a day, five days a week ever since then. There's nothing that has ever, ever, ever come anywhere near close to them commando tests physically. And I don't think there's anything you can do that can prepare you for them except get a shit ton of weight on your back, get yourself on the hills, and exhaust yourself for hours upon end. Mm. That is it. Um, yeah. You can be great circuit training, you can be fit boxing in the gym or whatever, but when you're a 17 year old kid who weighs maybe 65 kilos and they put a 65 kilo burger <laughs> on your back and tell you to do 30 miles, you know that, that circuit training ain't going to hold up. Yeah, yeah. It's a different thing. Yeah. Well, speaking of fitness, um, in the in the little bio that you sent us, you mentioned going through the physical training instructor's course. You said it's 17 weeks, and you said it was physically the hardest 17 weeks of my life by a mile. So tell tell us a little bit about that. So in the Royal Marines, we have um, something called the physical training branch. Uh, we actually have um, a swap draft with the USMC as well, where two of our instructors go and spend two years with the USMC. Two of their instructors come and spend time with us, um, learning from us, and we learn from them. Now, the, the physical training branch in the Royal Marines is like we kind of class ourselves as standard bearers because the, how do you explain this? We, we, as physical training instructors, or so as Royal Marines, we really pride ourselves on being able to do everything bigger and better than everyone else. So, if 
The parachute regiment are doing a 20 miler, we're doing a 30 miler. Mm. The army are doing a 20 miler, we're doing a 50 miler, you know. Whatever anyone else does, ours has got to be bigger, it's got to be harder, it's got to be more arduous, it's got to be longer, it's got to take more time. It, everything's got to be bigger and harder. And we instill that in our recruits from day one. You know, you're not here, you're not, this is not, you know, this is not the cadets, this is not the Boy Scouts, this is the big man's world. You're learning to go to war, to be a war fighter, mm. and you're gonna, uh, and we expect higher standards than anybody ex- expects. Now, as a P- as a physical training instructor, which we call a PTI, so I'll just refer to it as PTI. Mm-hmm. As a PTI, you are the guy that has to stand in front of these recruits and make all that shit look easy. You know, you have to be there making that shit look easy. So those recruits look up to you as like uh, you like you want to be like a role model. You, we 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 use the term whiter than white. You know. So if we're doing a 30 miler, we have to run along that 30 miler, not out of breath, twice as much kit as the recruits are wearing, gobbing off all the way, recruiting and motivating them and pushing them along. Um, so during the physical training instructors course, the PTI's course, everything that re- the recruits do in the 32 weeks of basic training, we do it again in 17 weeks. So we've already done it once as recruits. But well, we do it all again within that 17 week period, all the physical training, mm-hmm. and we do it harder. So, we have, for instance, as one example, one of the commando tests is um, we call the endurance course. Um, you run out there, you have like 22 pounds of equipment in your webbing uh, and your weapon. You run out there, it's four miles to get there to start with. Once you get there, your time starts. It's a two and a half mile cross country endurance course through tunnels, like we call them the smarty tubes, because they're like tubes like that you can just fit one person in. They're about a hundred meters long, and they're filled they're filled up to about this high with water, so you can just about breathe out the top. You can't even see down. You can't even see the end. It's just pitch black. Um, you've got people in front of you and behind you. You about as um, what would the word be claustrophobic as yeah. you possibly be. While still trying to maintain a, a, a time, because you've got to pass it by time. And there's, throughout the two and a half miles, there's, uh, there's various exercises like that. There's some tunnels that we call the sheep dip that are completely submerged in water, which you have to go in and, and your mate stands behind you and he tries to push you through it. And your other man stands at the other end and tries to pull you through it and you've got to drag your way through it and you can't breathe because it's full of water and your equipment's getting snagged. and it, You know, it's pretty... Pretty horrendous. Uh, and you have to do that. I, can't, I think the time off the top of my head is 72 minutes. So the, you have to pass the two and a half mile endurance course, and then you have to complete the four mile run back to camp. So by the time you get back to camp, you've done the four mile run out there, the two and a half mile endurance course, then the four mile back. You know, I think the recruits have. Uh, oh, it, your time starts at the beginning of the two and a half miles, so the four mile out there is not time, that's just, you've got to get there. Mm. Um, that's to simulate, for instance, if there was a helicopter pickup and you had to get there, the helicopter pick or there was a mission you had, to, you had to do and you had to be at a start line at a certain time, that's just to, that's just, uh, like, show that you can do that. Now, I think the recruits have got 72 minutes to do that in, so obviously as a PTI, before you do it, they say, yeah, you've got 72 minutes to do it in, same as recruits. But then that morning, they take you out and they give you an absolute beast in for about two hours on the assault course. So you're, you know, you're exhausted, you're flagging by the time you start. And then they're like, all right, guys, let's go. Yeah. You know, so everything we do is, it's got to be above and beyond what, what could be expected of everyone else. In fact, on day one of the course, um, the first three days, you go down about a month before the course starts and you, you do what's called an aptitude test to make sure you've got the right aptitude for the course because they're only looking for certain people. And um, you turn up and the first thing they tell you is, all right, guys, first thing we're going to do is a bleep test. I'm, I think you guys yeah. will be aware of a bleep test. So you'll do the the sprint bleep test, then you'll do a, the pull-up bleep test, then you do the press-up bleep test and the sit-up bleep test. And uh, if you're going to be a PTI and you're going to ask these recruits day in, day out for 32 weeks to give abs, because that's all we ask for is 100% effort. 
we don't expect anyone to be perfect. We don't expect anyone to be um, the finished article on day one. But what we do expect is 100% effort from from the minute they step foot on camp to the minute they leave. 100% effort. So if we're going to stand there and say that to them every single day, when you go on the aptitude course, the people who instruct you on that course, they want to see that from you. They want to see that you're going to empty the gas tank every time they ask you to empty your gas tank. So day one, you get there and you do the bleep test. You complete the bleep test and obviously everybody knows the standards that are required. So you give it absolutely everything you've got and you, you give it your 100% best effort. You walk outside, you're exhausted, you can't feel your arms and your legs, your lungs are burning, you, you're sucking oxygen like it's coming through a McDonald's straw. They walk you outside, they walk you around a circle for about five minutes and they go, right gents, good effort, now you know what the bleep test is, now we're going to start the real run. That was just a mock run through, oh, now we're going to do the real mm. one. So you're all looking at each other like, what are they talking about? I can't even lift my arms up at this point. But it's tough shit. You got to get through it. So you go that you go back in and you start again. And what they're looking for, they, they know you're not going to get the same results as you got last time. But they're looking for that guy that takes the easy route out. You know, the the guy goes, oh, I'm tired and goes, and then yeah, cheers, go and pe- pack your kit, go home, you're yeah. done. And then on the other end of it, they're looking for the guys that are going to exhaust themselves uh, and give it absolutely everything they've got. With because you all know that later on that afternoon, you've got more physical tests. And they're looking for the guys that are not even thinking about the afternoon. They're just going to give it everything they've got in that moment, in that bleep test, in that. And these these tests go on for three days. And they're looking for someone that's going to give it absolutely everything they've got on each one, with no regard to saving energy for the next one. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. yeah. So what's the uh, what's the kind of attrition rate then? Like in a, in your class, how many people actually graduate, or what's the percentage that actually make it? For the PTI course? Yeah. Well, as a PTI, first of all, you have to be a corporal. So you, you must have you must have been in the Royal Marines for maybe, I'd say average six to seven years before you even apply to the course. Then when you do apply to the course, your company sergeant major has to um, like acknowledge your application. He, he's got to give his blessing for your application. So he's looking at what sort of person you've been in, in, you know, as a soldier, as a Marine, what sort of effort you've got in. Are you going to do the company proud? Are you going to go down there? Like if I say, I, I, went, I was in Bravo Company, a 40 commando, and the, 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 our company, our major, like the company commander, we, we called him Johnny Bravo, because he just <laughs> loved Bravo Company. He, he was like, Bra- if you cut him in half, it'd say Bravo Company. Mm. So we called him Johnny Bravo, you know. So he would not even consider sending you on that course if he didn't think you were going to do the company proud. If you had one increment of doubt that you were going to fail, quit, not give 100% effort, whatever it was, he, he wouldn't even consider sending you. And pretty much all, all the company sergeant majors are the same, so all, all the company commanders are the same, should I say. So first of all, to, to apply for the... the PTI's course, you've already proved that you're a, you've already got a good few years experience under your belt, your, your commanders know that you're the right sort of person, you've already gone through about a 16 week um, command course to be a corporal to learn how to control and command people um, on the ground, uh, you've probably done a couple of operational tours so you've got that mental strength behind you, then you go down and do the aptitude course, I think there was about on my aptitude course, I'd say there was probably around 20 people. Of them, 20. And, and you've got to remember that those 20 people have already been whittled down from the hundreds of people that wanted mm-hmm. to do it. Of them, 20, probably uh, there was five of us got put on the course. And of the five, only three of us passed. Um, and that course usually runs twice a year, but the year I did it, it only ran once. So that year, there was only three PTIs actually mm. passed. Uh, the course, yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. Pretty rough. <laughs> so, uh, then also in the bio, you said in 2010 you joined the Special Forces Support Group, um, yeah. which you kind of equated it to U.S. Uh, Army Rangers. So, tell us just a little bit about that, and uh, then kind of 
you know, it was a couple years after that that I think you retired from the military. So kind of let it, tell us what led to that decision, too. Uh, yeah, so the, the Special Forces Sport Group is, um, and I mean, th this is, obviously I can't say anything here that's... Right, sure. That's classified or that's, that's, um, that's not out there in the public domain, but... This stuff that I'll say now is out there in the public domain anyway, it's on, it's on Wikipedia, it's on, it's on stuff like that. So, um, the Special Forces Sport Group was um, a unit that they, back in 2000, there was uh, an operation in Sierra Leone where the British military were in Sierra Leone on peacekeeping duties when the, um, they called, they called the, the RUF, the Revolutionary United Front, which was a, a rebel group in Sierra Leone. They took over all the diamond mines. Uh, they were trying to take over the country. Uh, they were they were a guerrilla warfare group out there, and the British military was out there. They, 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 we kind of went out there and put some, put some pressure on them. There was some quite um, safety firefights out there from special forces units and stuff. And when that finished, the British military stayed there as like a peacekeeping force. Now. During that time, I think it was the Irish Guards that were there. I could be wrong about that, but I think it was the Irish Guards. And uh, a patrol of them were captured by the, the Revolutionary United Front, the IUF. They captured these guys. There was like eight guys. I think there was two officers and six uh, like corporals and sergeants and stuff. They captured them and kept them hostage for, uh, I'd, be, I'd be guessing, but it was a long time that they kept them hostage for out in the jungle and they tortured these guys these were British soldiers they were tortured they were kept in shacks uh, there's a couple of books out about it which uh, if anyone's interested in the military it's well worth Google. I can't remember the name of the books but it's well worth Googling it and looking them up the things that they did to them were pretty horrific now uh, the British military or the British government do not negotiate with terrorists so the, the RUF had captured the British, uh, these British Irish guards and uh, they were sending out all sorts of crazy demands. We want this, we want that. But the British government do not negotiate with terrorists. So the only course of action was to send the special forces in. So the SAS and the SBS, which is the Special Air Service and Special Bolt Service, they launched a raid to obviously take out the terrorists and bring the boys home safe. They realised at that time that they needed support because of the sheer amount of the um, you know the rebels that were there they needed infantry support and they got that support from i think it was two par of the second battalion of parachute regiment so they went out there as infantry support to them so the, the special forces guys landed on the target took out the terrorists and they did um, a grade a gold standard as you would expect from the british special forces of um, rescuing the hostages the parachute regiment who were there as the infantry support did an absolute gold standard job of such like stopping the, the rebels from um, you know getting on top of the special forces guys, stopping them from backing up or resupplying their ammunition and stuff. And they took out various positions around that uh, um, area. And, and, the, and the mission, I think they lost one SAS soldier was killed during the mission. And they brought all the hostages home, and the mission was went down as like a, a huge success story for the British Special Forces. It was at that point that they kind of realised we need a dedicated unit to act as infantry support for our Special Forces. And I, I, from from speaking to guys and working with guys from the Delta Force and the Navy Seals and stuff, I get the I, I get the kind of impression that that's very similar to what the Rangers did, and that's where the Special Forces support group came from. And it's, it's a group that's made up of mainly um, British Royal Marines and parachute regiment soldiers. And there's a small detachment of uh, RAF regiment soldiers as well. And then there's obviously things like uh, AFCs, air fire controllers, and, um, you know... The logistic like people, yeah. Like that. And then, yeah, the, the, it's, it's now grown into, it's like a Tier 2 Special Forces unit. It's grown into its own beast now. It's, it's a really, really interesting unit to be part of. Um, and I was, I'm just thankful that, that I got to be part of that. Because some of the people that I met there and some of the, the things I got to do as part of that unit will be with me for the rest of my life. And um, 
I, I'm just really thankful that I got to be part of that, bro. Yeah. I learned so many lessons from being around for people that are that professional and that, that standard of soldier, that standard of human being, it, it just stands, it stays with you. Mm, awesome. So then what was it that kind of led to your decision to retire in 2012? Uh, MMA. Mm, okay. Um, well, 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 two things I would say is um, I was at, by 2012, I'd, I'd already been on the Ultimate Fighter. I'd already fought on Cage Warriors. Uh, and I was doing it part-time. You know, I was, I was a full-time soldier, part-time fighter. But I always believed in myself that, that, that I could go all the way in it. I always believed that... Um, like I said earlier, all or nothing, man. Um, I always believed that if I dedicate myself to it, I could go all the way in it. I could, I could be a world champion. I, you know, I could get to the to the big promotions. Um, and, and you know what? It, whether I did or didn't wouldn't really matter. What would matter is that that I tried. You know, that, that I give it a hundred percent. I never want to live with regret, so I never wanted to like walk walk away from being a pro MMA fighter, a seven and one, and just say, yeah, I, I was a fighter. That, that's never been enough for me. It's not about achievements. It's not about winning trophies or medals. It's about knowing that at the end of the day, I can sit back and say, I, I did everything I could do. I give it my 100% effort. And I was at a point in my career there where I, I had to go one way or the other. I had to either fully dedicate myself to the Royal Marines and to what I was doing. And obviously, we were, we were in a, we were in a, like, the stage in time, though, were before I joined the Royal Marines, there was no real wars for the British military since the Falklands, you know, in 1982. There was a small Gulf War one, I think, in 91, where it was maybe six weeks or something. There have been real no big wars. When I joined from 2003, when we first invaded Iraq, till about 2015, you know, it went on a few years after I left. There was no, it was a relentless phase of war. It was Iraq, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, it was this, it was that. So it was that relentless phase where I, I had to kind of say, what am I doing here? Am I going to fully commit to this and, and be the soldier I know I can be? Well, I already felt I'd achieved that. Um, I, I already felt, I mean, don't get me wrong, this. I'm a blue belt of soldier, and uh, you know, I compare myself to some guys like Al Weldon, who's probably soldier, and he's probably the biggest influence on me as a soldier. Um, he, he's a black belt, tenth dan. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a blue belt. Mm. But I already felt, I felt like I, I had got to a level of soldier where I could stand with any elite soldier in the world and say, "What we're we doing? I, I'm good to go." Do you know what I mean? I can do mm. this. I can lead men. I've led men under conflict. I've led man, men in battle. Uh, I've, I've, I've been led by better men in battle, and I've been the follower, and I've followed their commands. Um, I felt I'd got all the experience I wanted from the Royal Marines, and I also felt that, I'll, see, what happens is a lot of people leave the military on a bad standing, as in the last few years, they're a bit sick and tired of it. They've done mm. a long time. They, it's getting a bit, they get a bit down on it. Well, I never felt that. I felt like the 12 years I did in the military, I, I, was, just, I was just really lucky. I always had good jobs. I, I never had a bad job. I, I had really good jobs. I always had really good people around me. I loved every minute of it. So I just felt, finish on a high, leave it with good memories, leave it where it's got a special place in my heart, and now go and dedicate, give absolutely everything I've got to mixed martial arts, you know? Awesome. Um, the other thing that, that, that kind of, Pushed my decision as well with, with my kids. Um, when you go to Afghanistan, you get, during the tour, you get a two-week leave during the tour. So say you're there for seven, eight months, whatever. And during that time, you'll get two weeks where you get sent home, you have two weeks off, then you go back. My son was born during that two weeks. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was eight weeks before the end of our tour of Afghanistan, uh, we just uh, we just lost one of my one of my teammates had just been killed in an IED blast about a week before, uh, which was pretty uh, pretty pretty hard. You know, it hit home pretty hard. It was a hard time for me and all my team. Um, and then the week after, I went home for two weeks, and my son was born. Um, 
and I've got two weeks with my daughter, got two weeks with my newborn son, and got two weeks with my wife who's just gone through a fucking pregnancy while her husband's in Afghanistan. Mm. Talk about fucking strong mind. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, she's someone that I look up to and respect forever. You know, she, she sat there and waited for me while I'm in Iraq, Afghanistan, Northern Ireland, here, there, everywhere. In I think 2004, I, I went to Iraq, come back for about three weeks, and then went back to Norway for four months. I've seen her for about three weeks all year. Mm-hmm. You know, no problem. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? No, no, like, what are you doing? Come home. Nothing. No problem. Just a rock, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah I got to spend them two weeks with them and then I went back for about seven or eight weeks and again it was just uh, a, re- a relentless seven or eight weeks as you would expect in, in the Helmand province at that time and there were just times where I was thinking am I even going to even see this kid again am I even going to get to see my son so that kind of pushed my, my hand as well because you know when I had Olivia my daughter I, I was still quite young immature by the time I had Jensen, my son, and, I, and I, I got to bring my daughter up for them years as well, I, I, I kind of grew up as a person a bit more and uh, had them responsibilities. And, uh, and them responsibilities way outweighed me going fucking living my dreams, mm. fighting wars and stuff with mm. my mates, you know. So, yeah, it was that. It was the, 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 the mixed martial arts and, and my, my kids and wife, yeah. Okay. So taking a little step back then, you mentioned you did a little bit of martial arts before the military. When did you get into it seriously? So, what happened, so the UFC came out in about 93 and I'd never heard of it until probably 2004, I'd say. Excuse me. Uh, about 2004. <coughs> in about, I'm, I might be wrong with my dates, but I think about 2000. And, or maybe late, even, even late 2004, I went on a, a tour of Senegal, a uh, country on the west coast of Africa, just doing my little north east south west On the west coast of Africa, right next to Sierra Leone, um, and we went out there on ship, so we sailed out there on ship, so a good few weeks, we did a, a tour there a, around the jungle and stuff, really good, really interesting tour, seen a lot of shit out there that that I'd never get to see a lot of what there was no conflict out there. It was an exercise, but I got saw a lot of wildlife. Spent some time mm. living in the jungle. It was it was a good time. On the way back, we were on ship again, and back in them days, no one had mobile phones, just touch screens or anything like that. We had portable DVD players, and my mate Cy Stroud had bought a couple of UFC DVDs, so he's showing them me on the way back and. Which we're, we're going back on the ship and me and him watching these UFC DVDs and we're like, what? What's this? And there was actually a couple of mats on, in the gym space on the ship. It was like nothing special. It was like below the deck. It stunk. It was rusted to death. But there was a couple of mats. So me and him were just like watching UFC videos and trying to practice arm bars and practice jolts. We didn't know anything. You know, we had no idea. And uh, when I got back, I just I just went and found the local, the, the most local MMA gym to me, which was, it was called Team Quantum. Um, and it was run by the Butlin brothers, Ian Butlin, Dave Brooklyn, and Andy Butlin, who were like, they were, I don't know if you, you've heard of them. Yeah, but yeah. They were kind of like, yeah, they, they, they were like way ahead of the time. Like, back in those days, people were still doing just Thai boxing or just jiu-jitsu or whatever. These guys had a full MMA gym back in them days. They had a cage, a boxing ring. They brought Nogueira over. They brought Eddie Bravo over. They brought uh, Roberto Otala over. They were way, they were miles ahead of the time. And it was lucky for me that they were like seven, eight miles away from me. So I got home, I found their gym. And obviously I, fa- I fancied myself as a bit of a tough guy, you know what I mean? I was, I was a Royal Marine, I got a bit of boxing from Rochdale. fancied myself as a bit of a scrapper. Went down there with a big chunk of ego on my shoulders. Got a few rounds in with Ian Butlin, showed me what to do, and went home humble to say the least. You know, <laughs> got chokes everywhere you could get chokes. Got armbar everywhere I could get armbar. Uh, my physical fitness and my physical strength didn't give me any help whatsoever. He just played with me like I was a kid. 
And I was pretty big at that time. I was doing a hell of a lot of weights. So I was probably about 13 and a half, maybe 14 stone. Ian was in fight shape. He was maybe 11 stone, 11 and a half. And he just played me with it like, like I didn't exist. Uh, and I just went home thinking, there's guys out there that can do that to you. I've mm. got to learn that shit, man. <laughs> I've got to learn that shit, man. I, I, felt, I was a Royal Marine Commando. I'm, you know, what if I go on operations and there's someone out there that can do that shit to you? Mm. I wasn't risking that. And, and, I, and I got, and I just fell in love with it. And, and the team we had back there in them days was a real close team. And um, I got some real good friends with And, I, and you, you guys will know this. Mixed martial arts, the people you meet in mixed martial arts, or in martial arts in general, some people have a misconception that because you're a fighter or whatever, or you're into fighting, that you're going to be some kind of thug, or you're going to be some kind of aggressive guy. That, in my experience, has been the complete opposite. Most of the people I've met in mixed martial arts, in jiu-jitsu, in Thai boxing, in boxing, in wrestling, are the most humble, kindest, uh, most helpful human beings you can find. Mm. And uh, like when I found that with, with the Butlin brothers, like these are guys who could show me unconscious without even thinking about it, yet they'll spend three hours on the mat of their own time when they could be home with the kids showing me how to do a footlock. Mm. I'm thinking, fuck, this is something different, man. This is something else, you know. And, that, and I wanted to be part of it. That's awesome. So then when did you get to uh, actually step in the cage for the first time and begin competing? Too early is what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, nowadays the sport's grown, so nowadays we'll put people through a fundamentals course where we teach them, you know, basics of footwork, how to jab, how to slip, how to roll, we teach them to clinch, head to, the, you know, put them through a fundamentals package and then we'll they pass that and then we'll start and bring them into the fighters team and then we'll start doing a little bit of pads and it might be a year or something before they start to fight. I think it was about five months before I had my first fight. Um, which was a, a fight down in Exeter, which is, it's the, for the American audience listening, is, is the other end of the country, maybe 300 miles away, because there was no fights. There, there, was, no, there was no shows in the UK. There was, there was nowhere to do it, so uh, the guys had to find me a fight, and it was the other end of the country. And those were the days when you turned up to an MMA show you never heard of your opponent, you know, there was no idea who he was or if he was a legit debut guy or if he was fifth, there was no idea. So you look through the changing rooms and if you had a pair of tie boxing shorts on, that was now your game plan was to take him down. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you had a pair of grappling shorts on, shit, he's got grappling shorts on, keep him on his feet. And that, you know, that's, as, that's as far as we could get. And that, that was my first fight, I went down there uh, and in all fairness to the guy, I thought, I've no idea his name, he was... It was semi-pro back in them days because amateur in the UK was no headshots on the feet, believe it or not. You weren't allowed to punch people in the head on the mm. feet. So it was basically a bad grappling match with leg kicks. So I was never interested in doing that. So I did the semi-pro fight. Um, and the first fight I did, I'm not, I could, like I said, I have no idea the name of the guy. Um, and I, I mean absolutely no disrespect to him. But when I got in the cage, within seconds I realised this guy should not be here. He's, mm. he's coming out with like, doing all this stuff with his hands, like kind of Kung Fu for stuff. And my mindset was just, I thought, this guy should not be in here. I might not be that good, but I know I'm pretty tough. I know if I stick it on him, he's going to give up. So that's just what I did. So just no technique whatsoever. I just went and had a street fight for five minutes and sat inside the cage. <laughs> and then with, literally with one second left in the, in the first round, he, he's gone through the towel and that was it. Mm. And, then, and then I thought I was a superstar. And then you were hooked. <laughs> then I thought I was a superstar, and I, and I sharply learned that I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you make your way to uh, SPG and Carl, and how did all that happen? Um, I don't, I'd always followed Carl and SPG. Um, I, don't know what, I, don't know, I don't know how I started following Carl, but... I started following Carl very early as soon as I got into mixed martial arts because everyone was just trying to find the feet in mixed martial arts in the UK back then. But Carl had, had the benefits of cross training with our, you know, with SBG worldwide head coach Matt Thornton yeah. and all Travis and all the all the guys out there. 
So he'd yeah. have that experience that maybe the rest of the UK or a lot. Of, there was other guys in the UK that had that experience as well. But he was one of the pioneers that really had that experience. So I started following him from the start because he was putting out articles on Google and stuff about concepts of aliveness and stuff like that. And I remember years ago, I read uh, an article by Matt Thornton about SBG, the G standing for the word gym. And it said, like, we're not an academy, we're not a school, we're a gym. This is fighting. You know, we're not here to... Uh, play tiddlywinks we're here to fight and in a gym you work out and that's what SBG was about and about aliveness not going through catters or sequences that have no relevance to real fighting and it just gripped me Re reading that gripped me as a Royal Marine everything is about reality you mm. know, because our reality is if you mess up you die um, so everything as as a Marine was about reality for me and when I started to read things by Carl and Matt and, and John Kavanagh and, and stuff. I, I was gripped by it straight away, but it was it was it wasn't till maybe I think 2014 or 13 I, I actually went over to SBG. Um, yeah, and, and that was that was I used to train at Team Cowboy in Liverpool, which you'll know Darren Tills, yeah, uh, Team Cowboy, Terry Etty, Mark Scanlon, um, Paul Taylor, some. Awesome fight. Some of the best stand up fighters that have ever come out of the UK. Even I go as far as the world, man. Darren Till, Terry and the two of the best strikers in the world. With the head coach, Colin Heron, who's, again, a, he's a fountain of knowledge. You, that guy, that guy, you can do pads with Colin Heron. He'll be stood a foot in front of you and he can still kick you in the head. Mm. You don't need any distance, any run. He's, he's technique so bland. And um, I, I was training with him for about six years. But when I left the Marines and uh, and I opened my own gym, I was I was travelling all the way to Liverpool to train, and then driving back. And my my, my work life balance just wasn't there. It, it was the, when I left Team Cowboy, it was all through my faults and my like my kind of inability to travel to Liverpool, travel back, and and I'd want an hour at home, and then the next morning I'd get up and I'd think. Oh, I don't want to do that drive. It, the team was amazing. Colin's amazing as a coach. Um, it was all it was all through my inability to kind of work out that work life balance. So um, I, I knew I had to make a change and, and SB I, I, was my only ever choice. You know, it, it was the only thing, the only other place that I would go because of how much I followed Carl and Matt and John in, in the in the previous years. Yeah. Was Carl one of the first black belts, uh, jiu-jitsu black belts in the UK? Yeah, um, as far as I know, I, I think he would have been one of, one of the early black belts, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I, I would guess so. He must have been a black belt 12 years. Yeah, I'd actually, I mean, I'd heard about him. Yeah, I always tried to keep in touch with what was going on kind of back home and in the UK and that because, you know, I left in 86 to come here and there was nothing going on really, you know, back then, um, very little. I mean, I was I was fighting. Uh, You're in Belfast, right? No, Dublin. I was from Dublin. Oh, like Dublin, right, yeah. Um, but I was fighting exclusively Muay Thai when I was back home. Um, I mean, I was doing a little bit of grappling. But it, it, it wasn't even Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It was more like, you know, Judo and stuff like that. But So I always was fascinated watching the buzz starting to happen back home. And yeah. But I'd heard of Carl, but I actually never met him until we all ended up in Iceland together, which is where we met. Really? Yeah. That was the first time you met him. Face to face, yeah. But I'd heard about him. I'd read some of his stuff. And, you know, he was just kind of a mad scientist is what it appeared you know, when you would, yeah. you know, um, and then when I met him, he was a mad scientist too, but like Absolutely. technically just obsessed with yeah. breaking things apart, whether it was striking, um, his pad technique was pretty unique too. Seconds or not. Yeah, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't Thai by any means, um, and it, it was wasn't, MMA. yeah, it wasn't classic boxing. Um, yeah, it was MMA, man, it was Carl's pad, the way Carl and his you know, he taught me a lot about pad work and Matt Inman, who's our head yeah. coach now at SPG UK. He, you know, we, we took a lot of lessons from the way Carl did that, uh, the, the MMA style pad work. 
I think he was. Well, for me, I mean, I I don't like to make claims like go and say like he was the first this or I was the first dog with it, but you can never prove any of that. And it's bollocks anyway. But it, for me, he was the first guy that I'd seen that was that was doing this kind of MMA style pad work. You know, we were taking into account the, the closing distance, the, the, the range, the extra range. You know, in, in MMA, there's probably an extra foot of distance from what there would be in Thai boxing. There's yeah. More level change going on and stuff. And Carl, for me, was one of the first person people that I'd ever seen integrating all that. You know, the final eye behind me for integration. So, um, yeah, it, it, that's what he was, man. A mad scientist. He had an obsession with. with with perfecting techniques, with perfecting philosophies and principles. So I, I should probably, because I mentioned Iceland. So, what what year was Iceland? Do you remember? Two thousand. It would have even been twelve, late thirteen, or maybe early fourteen. Okay, so John Kavanagh, before the UFC came to Dublin. To avoid distractions, took all of the guys that were going to be fighting on that show, including Connor, and just isolated themselves in Iceland and then brought in stud fighters like yourself and other people. And basically, for about three, four weeks, just kind of isolated things and, um, and put on an absolutely phenomenal training camp everything from the meals to everything was all about Amazing. performance and how can we get the most um that that for me was my first experience of the spg world like worldwide community i'd be training at manchester and obviously i heard about you know the one try one by you know we always talk about that and uh well, that 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 trip was the first time i'd actually experienced the whole thing all the iceland guys the Dublin guys, yourself coming over, all the Manchester guys coming over, and it was everything I ever thought it would be and more. And it, you know, just getting over there and seeing how, how well it was structured. And for me as well, I've not long been in SVG, and all of a sudden, yo, do you want to come out to Iceland for a for a training camp? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm a bit skimmed. And I don't mind. It's not going to cost you nothing. Halley, who who. Um, Runs me on the road there, Gunnar Nelson's dad, who's another phenomenal person. Um, he, he paid our flights. Uh, I think we stayed at his house. We didn't have to pay any training costs. Every time we went for a meal, put your hand in your pocket. I was like, oh, it's done. I'm like, this is just unreal, you know. Um, and that's kind of that is SPG. That's it. That's SPG, and that's the one try, one vibe mentality. Look after our own. And there was some phenomenal fucking talent on that mat. Um, um, just an amazing group of people and just everybody there just trying to soak up knowledge from the coaches and from each other and um, that was a, it was a fun time. A yeah, fun oh, time. yeah, it was amazing. Great camping. Gunny was there, Connor was there obviously, me, Matt Inman, Saul Rogers, James Gallagher was there. Yeah. Before he Cal. what he's doing now. Yeah. He was putting that work in back then. See, this is the thing people don't see. They'll see like James or Kiefer or someone on the top of Bellator cars now. They don't realise that, you know, and they'll sit back and they're like, must be, must be nice to be able to be, or look, it's all right for him. He's, you know, he's with John Kavanagh and stuff. Yeah, but he was doing all that work all them years ago. They were putting that work in all them years ago in gyms. Yeah. When nobody knew about him. You know, when he was 15 year old, nobody knew about these guys. He's still putting that work in, believing in it. And, and now look what it's, look what the fruits. Yeah. So you mentioned Carl. Um, what was his full name? Tanswell. Tanswell. So basically, there's kind of more of a story to that. Um, if we can get into that, just just a little bit. We're starting to run out of time, but I do want to touch on that because I think it's kind of important. So I, either one of you can kind of maybe tell a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, Stapes, Carl passed away. Um, um, and uh, he lost his coach. Um, you know, you get, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say you go into war with fellow soldiers, you, you almost yeah. expect that somebody might not make it, but when you come home, yeah. you know, you don't, you don't expect something like this to happen. No, 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 it's, you certainly don't. Um, no, I mean, I mean, 
Cal, Cal's, Cal is by far and wide the biggest influence on my martial arts career. Uh, like I said, just back in the early days of reading the stuff that he was putting out there and seeing the stuff he was putting out there, I was already a fan of his. And I, you know, what you know, when I got to this is the guy that Carl is, right? This the first day I went over to SBG, this is the type of man that Carl is that, that made me knew this is the guy I wanted to work with. He didn't let me train on the match that he invited me over and he, he, uh, he didn't let me train. He said, Oh, we're gonna go up for a coffee, so we went for a coffee. Did all the usual small talk, you know, uh, you know what, what's your plans, this, that, and the other. Then he says, um, why, why, why are you leaving your old gym? What, what's the reason you're moving on? Why are you leaving? And I told him exactly what I just told you. I said, you know, it's, 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 it, it's my reason. That it's an amazing gym, great gym. I'm, I, you know, I've got nothing but good things to say about that gym. I'm leaving for, because I couldn't, work out my work-life balance is completely my fault blah 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 Carl stands up shakes my hand and says right you can join SPG I'm like what wow, what's just going on he went if you'd have started talking shit about your old gym I'd have sent you on he goes because the way they join is the way they leave mm. he said if you'd have come and joined here talking shit about your old gym that's the way you'd have left he said if you'd have started talking shit today you wouldn't have been part of SPG but you didn't so now you're part of SPG and 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 that it, it just for me, because that's me, that's what I want, that's what I want about. I, I call the spade a spade, you know what I mean? I, I've got no, I'm, I've got uh, one of my close mates, Andy Buckling. He, he's, he's a pro boxer, he has truth without fear written on the back of his shorts. And that's a, that's something I believe in and I try and live my life by. And that's clearly what Carl did as well. Awesome. Yeah, sounds like a, a great influence. and Yeah, uh, phenomenal. I, I almost think we need to start doing that with some of our yeah. <laughs> gym members. Yeah. For awesome. sure. Well, we are running out of time, so let's um, let's kind of start to wrap it up. What what are your goals for the future? You're a coach now. Are you still fighting? Or yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm coaching full time and I'm fighting full time. Okay. My my goals. I mean, this is something I've thought about long, long and hard. Maybe over the last twelve months, uh, because obviously I won a, I won the Bama World Title in 2015, and uh, since then I've had a bit of an up and down stretch. I've won some big fights, lost some big fights, uh, and over the last 12 months, I kind of sat back and thought, right, what, you know, what do I want out of this sport, what do I want to do with it, and like, I focused on coaching quite a lot over the last 12 months, uh, and, and then I look at some, you know, I look at some guys, and you see them in the UFC and stuff, and they say like, when they're training for fights, they have to be, go to the gym, train, go home, sleep, eat, go back to the gym, train, they can't have anything else in their life. But that is not me. That's not who I am. That's not the type of person I am. I, I like my life to be packed. Mm. Uh, if I go to the gym, train, come home, sleep, go back to the gym, train, I feel like I'm only leading half of my life of not being who I am. And it, and I kind of battled with that because of what, like, what, when I have been coaching and training for fights, I've, I've been listening to that like a little devil on my shoulder saying to me, no, you should be doing more for yourself. Stop doing more. Stop doing things for other people. You need to be focusing more on yourself. And but that's not who I am. That's not what makes me happy. That's not me. That I shine when I'm doing when I'm giving a hundred percent for myself, and I shine when I'm giving a hundred percent for others uh, and trying to be the best coach I can be. Uh, and that's what I'm doing now. And that's that's my my goal now over the next couple of years is to give more of myself to to the people around me and give more of myself to myself and my fight career. Uh, and I want to be the first person ever to win the Cage Warriors and Bama World Title. That's that's my that's my big goal. That's mm. my goal as a as a fighter, as a as a coach. Um, I think when you start off as a coach, you come into it and you go, "I want a fight team. I want fighters." And you get a few fighters, you think, "I want I want to get them on the big promotions. I want pros. I want this and that." And then as it goes along, you kind of realise that that mentality doesn't really breed a good culture so over the last few years I've seen, and especially since joining SPG is I've kind of realised now that it's not about focusing on fighters or trying to make people be fighters or trying to create fighters the best thing as a coach that I can do is create a good culture where everyone's comfortable on the mat whether they're a 50 year old guy coming for a hobby or whether they're a pro athlete trying to get in the UFC 
I'm not saying they're going to spar together, you know, <laughs> but I'm saying create a culture on the map that's about the people, not about the achievements. Mm. You know, uh, may, may you know remember the guy, remember the name of the guy that's just just turned up this week, just as much as you remember the name of the guy who's got three British titles around his waist. Uh, and you build that culture, and and you you make it about the people, not about the achievements, and then all of a sudden you've got a lot of pro fighters. And then all of a sudden you've got people looking at Bellator contracts, looking at UFC mm-hmm. contracts and stuff. So as a coach, that 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 is that's kind of my main thing is build that culture, keep mm-hmm. building that culture, keep improving that culture, keep making people feel more comfortable on the mat, keep yeah. making, inviting more people on the mat, uh, keep them enjoying it, keep them coming back. And I love my quotes. You've probably got it by now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the Royal Marines, as as a as a physical training instructor, what they say to you is, don't light a fire underneath someone, light a fire within them. And, mm. I, and that's something that I try and do in martial arts. So don't light a fire underneath them by screaming and shouting at them, more, more, more. No, light a fire within them, give them a reason to want to do more. Not to tell them to do more, give them a reason to want to do more. And uh, that's how my coaching's changed over the years. And that's, I want more of that. I want, mm. I want to make a better culture. Yeah, those are my goals. I love that. I wish uh, I wish more people and organizations kind of had those goals. I mean, imagine if politics and business and all yeah, that right. were, were run like that. That would uh, I think we'd have a better world. <laughs> hey, this is what I keep saying. Travis Davidson should be the next president of the USA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> imagine that. Imagine what a country you'd have. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool that uh, requirement to be a president is a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, it would, it would uh, <laughs> well, definitely. Just like the coolest, most humble guy ever that can show you out. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> awesome. Well, we really appreciate you coming on today. Um, want to respect your time, and uh, I think you're picking up your wife, you said, correct? Yeah, she just, she's at the airport now, so yeah. All right. Well, we will let you get to her. Um, thank you so much for this time, and I'm really looking forward to letting people hear kind of your perspective. Can I, can I just make one mention before we go? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a, an ambassador for a, of an organization called Reorg. Uh, Reorg is um, uh, started by a friend of mine, Sam Sheriff, who is a sergeant major in the Royal Marines. And it's a registered charity within the Royal Marines now. And it's for all, not just Marines, for any ex or serving personnel with any physical or mental disabilities. Or, or even you haven't got a mental illness, maybe you, you just want to come and chill with the guys. And we use Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as a, way of, or as a pathway of helping people to live a better life, to understand themselves better, to be happier and stuff like that. So if there is any military veterans out there, or, or do you know what, even if you're not a military veteran, if you've got a mental health problem or issue on... You want you want to come and do some jujitsu? Drop me a message. Drop uh, Royal Marines Jujitsu a message on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and um, you know we'll see you on the mat soon. Okay. Help you. Yeah, I should have I should have asked that before we were were closing. Is there anywhere else? So you said Royal Marine Jujitsu and yeah. Instagram. Anywhere Royal else? Royal Marines Jujitsu on their Instagram is the main way you'll find them. I think they also have a Facebook page, uh, but the Instagram is the main way you'll find them. There's loads of Guys out there trying to. Tom Hard is one of the ambassadors. Uh, Ant Middleton's one of the ambassadors. You know, we, we, uh, I think Andre Galvao. 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 Yeah. Have you said? Mm-hmm. I don't know. He's one of the ambassadors. Um, so it's a really good organisation. Uh, Sam's doing amazing things with it, and he's helping a lot of people. So, like I said, if there is anyone out there that wants to get in touch, get in touch, man. Okay. And what about you personally, or your gym, or your fighters? Yeah, so my gym is uh, Full Contact Performance Centre. You'll find us on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we have a website, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, same thing. Anyone wants to come down? Um, you dream of being the next Conor McGregor, come down. Do or if you just want a hobby, something to do in the evenings, and meet some new mates, come down. Any uh, any name from your gym that people should be paying attention to? Any up-and-coming fighter? I don't like that question because... You ask that question, I get asked that question all the time, and then I could name 10 guys. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to name three people right now because two of them have got a fight coming up this weekend. That's Oliver Stokes, Kyle Fletcher, two young amateurs coming through the ranks who are better than I was when I'd had 10 pro fights. You know, these are young, hungry guys, easiest guys to coach. You show them some 
they don't even speak. They just go and do it a million times until they've got it. They've got big fights coming up this weekend on John Kavanagh's promotion, Euro Fight Night. Uh, so check them out. Yeah, check the Instagram page out, uh, Euro Fight Night, if you get a chance. And the other one I'll mention is a guy who's been like a protege to me since day one. He's, he, the day one we opened the gym, he's been on the mats ever since. He never misses. I've just been doing his sparring for him this morning. He's in preparation for MTK, which are a huge, uh, are trying to be a yeah. promotion over in Europe at the moment. You've probably heard of that. Uh, that's Antonio Sheldon. Got a big fight coming up on that in uh, four weeks' time. We're right at the peaking stage now, so check him out, man. He's, he's going to do big things, and that he's going to be a world champion. Huh? Awesome. Well, I'll put links to all the the gym uh, and the the uh, Royal Marines Jiu Jitsu uh, Instagram on our show notes. So if people want to check that's that out, check out our, our show notes. And once again, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate what you had to say. Thanks for giving me the opportunity, man. It's been it's been a good chat. Right. Stace, you're a legend, man. Appreciate it, buddy. We'll talk soon. Thank you very much. And hey, if you ever want to come stateside anytime, you know you're more than welcome. That's all here now, sir. I'm going. Oh, yeah. 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 It's all good. Thank you, man. No, I will take you up on that. And you know what? I might even bring some of my fighters out for a little Just let me know. We'll make it happen. Perfect. All right, buddy. Take care, man. Good talking with you. See you. Cheers.